together. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa sadhu 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 Okay, please put your palms down. Good evening, brothers and sisters. How are you all today? Ah, so today we have a camera right in front of me. As a result, those who are sitting behind the camera will be blocked. Uh. <laughs> Can you all still see me? Or is this what you all were hoping for? <laughs> that I cannot see you? <laughs> today's topic, what is today's topic? It's about the seventh month. Uh. Yeah. Uh, after we arranged the talk and uh, the poster came out, uh, I thought, uh, by the time we have the talk, it will be over. Huh? You all may feel safer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that is the first misconception about the seventh month. <laughs> yeah, traditionally in the Chinese community, there's something called Zhongyuanjie. Yeah, Zhongyuanjie. Zhongyuanjie by the name itself is a festival. Yeah, it's not something sad, not something scary. It's a festival. Yeah, just like Zhong Chu Jie, Duan Wu Jie, and so on and so forth. Yeah, the Chinese were quite into festives. Yeah, and similar to Qingming Jie. Yeah. Uh, so what is it about this Zhongyuan Jie and the uh, Yue, the so-called Gui Jie? Huh? Yeah. Uh, the Ghost Festival. A raise uh, uh, a show of hands. How many of you have seen ghosts in your life? Oh, one, one person. Only one person, two person. Huh? Can hear, cannot see. You didn't pay the full subscription. <laughs> <laughs> How about you? Did you? Can you see and hear, or only see, cannot hear? See a bit. Ah, that one that is demo trial version. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Most <coughs> most of us have not seen ghosts before. But how many of you have heard of ghost stories? Mm, plenty, isn't it? Yeah. I think most of us since primary school have heard of ghost stories. Yeah. So there's a lot of law and a lot of speculation that goes around regarding the seventh month festival. Uh, most Chinese uh, believe or at least feel that it is a time where ghosts from the underworld will get a free pass uh, for one month to roam the streets. Yeah? Uh, and then after one month, they all have to return to the underworld. But um, how does that uh, compare to what we learn in the uh, suttas, yeah? in particular the Pali Canon? And what is the basis for us to be so-called celebrating it? And then later, we, we perhaps we'll talk about how we celebrate it yeah? and the significance of it. Okay. In the Buddhist tradition, uh, today in Singapore, it doesn't matter whether you are in the Chinese temple or Theravadan temple or others. Yeah, most temples would have some form of uh, prayers that would be ongoing during the lunar seven month. Uh, in the Buddhist tradition, the basis for this is found in the Ulambana Sutta or Sutra, if you will. Yeah. Uh, so this in this sutra, it is said that one of the Buddha's chief disciple, Venerable Maha uh, is said to have observed his mother, 
uh, passing away and being born in the, in which realm? In the hungry ghost realm, uh, uh, suffering there. Mm. And so, uh, imagine, uh, not imagine, how many of you uh, is fortunate enough, blessed enough to still have your parents with you? Raise your hands. Mm. So, do you all stay with your parents? How many of you st are st still staying with your parents? Oh, very fortunate. Uh, Chinese have a saying, Jia yo yi lao, ru yo yi bao. Yeah, the traditional Chinese saying that in every home, if you have an elderly staying with you, hmm, any issue with the mic? Or for them to... Oh, a bit soft, huh? Oh, can you all hear me from behind? Oh. Uh, is this better? Wow. <laughs> now, now I must speak softer. <laughs> softer. <laughs> so it is said that in every family, if you have an elderly, yeah, it is a treasure. Mm. So, uh, imagine, uh, imagine if you see that your, or in, if you know that your parents, whether father or mother, is born in the lower realms, how would you feel? You'll feel sad, isn't it? Yeah, you'll feel sad. Uh, besides feeling sad, what would you do? Would you do anything? Huh? Do prayers, huh? And then maybe do a ceremony and bring your parents up. <laughs> Can or not? Yeah. So that was what Venerable Mahamogalana tried to do. Yeah. He, uh, he, being one of the chief disciples and chief in psychic power, he was able to uh, use his psychic power you know, to see the different realms and then to even try to help them. Mm. Yeah. Any, anything? Put nearer. Oh, is it loud enough? If I put really close, then... <laughs> is this better? Huh? You all prefer this or prefer this? Prefer this? This. Okay. Yeah, I go with the, <laughs> the preferences of the masses. Huh? But is it too soft for you? Loud and clear. Okay, good. Yeah, so... Uh, Venerable Mahamogalana is said to have tried to uh, help his mother. Uh, he tried to help his mother by feeding her because she was born into the hungry ghost realm. Mm. But whatever food that he manifests when he offered to her and he tr she tried to consume it would, upon reaching his mouth, turn into burning charcoal, burning flame. Yeah, he, he was not able to help her. Yeah, so, um, seeing this, he was, uh, he, he was, should I say perplexed? Well, he went to see the Buddha to ask for help. Mm. So the Buddha advised him that uh, when, the, when the Sangha, yeah, uh, when the Sangha uh, have a, an assembly, to perform an offering yeah, uh, on behalf of the mother yeah, and through these merits of the Maha Sangha, then his mother can be uh, reborn in other realms. Uh, have you heard of this sutra before? How many of you have not heard of this sutra before? Or just a handful have not heard before? Hmm. So, uh, this sutra can be found in the Mahana, uh, Chinese Mahana Tripitaka. Uh, so when, before I came here, yeah, before I come here, I was thinking, hmm, if I share with you a Chinese sutra, not very convincing, huh? Yeah, because you may not have read it, and maybe the source itself, hmm. Well, in the past, I have come across one other sutta. And this is in the Pali Canon. Yeah, and not just one sutta. 
quite a couple of other suttas relating to ghosts. Yeah. And in a way, if you look at all the different suttas that touches on ghosts, then you find that uh, the notion of what ghosts are uh, is quite different from what we usually think of. Mm. Number one, uh, most of us have not seen ghosts before. Number two, uh, how many of you have read suttas regarding ghosts? Huh? No one. Uh? A few. Uh? Just a handful. Yeah. So, uh, as a result, where do we get information about ghosts? From? From our parents, from stories, from movies. Yeah. How do ghosts, how do movies portray ghosts? Very ugly, uh? very scary. Yeah? And there's usually some background music. Yeah. Oh. And then there's usually wind. And then it's, it's usually, most importantly, it's usually at night. Isn't it? Yeah. I recall that in the Pali Canon, there was one particular sutta about Venerable Ananda. Yeah. He was entering into one of the city yeah, for arms. And before he entered the city, he saw, he saw a being at the gate. Yeah, towards the side of the gate. Mm. The translation, the translation for this being is called hungry shades. Yeah, hungry shades. Not translated as ghost, but hungry shades. Mm. Yeah. Uh, in the in Pali, what is the term for ghost? Peta, right? Yeah, usually use peta. Yeah. So one of the translation I saw was shades yeah meaning that um, when 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 venerable ananda or others saw them saw them like a shade yeah you know shade yeah like uh, darken mm. not like us you know like in a shadow like that although it's not in the shadow and consider do you remember what i just said what was venerable ananda entering the city for for arms. When do they go for arms? In the morning. Yeah? Before the Buddha set down the rule, uh, the monks would go at any time. But after the Buddha had set the rule, the monks would go for arms only in the morning, before noon, isn't it? Yeah. So this sutta occurred in daylight. Yeah? In daylight. And he saw a ghost. Hmm, interesting. Yeah? And not just that, he saw the ghost on the side and he felt compassion for that ghost, that hungry shit. Yeah? The description, hungry ghost is in which realm? In the upper realm or lower realm? Lower realm. How do we describe the three lower realms? We describe them as woeful states. Yeah? Woeful states. Mm, the bad destinations, yeah? the realms of suffering. Mm. So this is uh, one aspect I want to touch on today, which is how we look at ghosts. Yeah? Because when we think about Hungry Ghost Festival, we usually think, wow, this month, wow, suya, suya. <laughs> yeah? Statistically, I've, I was told that every year, in the month of August, usually, yeah, there is very few weddings going on. If you get married in August, it's very cheap. <laughs> yeah? Is it true? Huh? Yeah. So this is due to our own perception yeah, that uh, in the month of August, the lunar seven month, uh, it's an unlucky month. Why? Because all the ghosts is roaming the streets. Yeah. And I was also told that high occur occurrence of accidents. Huh? Is it true or not? Maybe we should check with the traffic police. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how true the second part is, but I've heard many people mention about the first, uh, first notion that 
few people get married, at, at least Chinese, okay? Few Chinese get married during the uh, seventh lunar month. Mm. But when we look at the sutta, the Buddha don't describe goals as unlucky. It is not the unlucky goals realm. Yeah? Correct or not? It's the hungry goals realm, not unlucky goals realm. <laughs> not scary goals realm. Not dangerous goals realm, but hungry goals realm. But are all goals hungry? Ah, that's another thing. While the sutta that I mentioned uh, depicts or describes how Venerable Ananda observed this hungry shit. Yeah? Uh, in this state where the desire to, be, uh, to, to have the thirst quenched, hunger uh, subsided, yeah? it's not fulfilled, but yet cannot be done. However, if you look at other suttas, there are also other suttas describing goals, describing spirits. Yeah? Uh, ho a whole range of different uh, beings, all falling under this same category, but not hungry. Mm. In the Chinese text, the translation is Da Li Gui Wang. Mm. Da Li Gui Wang. So there are certain beings that has, um, in a way we can say, psychic power, you know, even psychic power. But how is it that ghosts have psychic power? It is where they have merits as well. Mm. So it's actually a whole range. In one of the commentary, it then described, then why is it that we commonly call this realm hungry ghost realm? Hmm. It is because of all the different types of ghosts that exist, or spirits if you will, hungry ghosts, <laughs> okay, you can see her, right? Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, just to be sure. Huh? Yeah. No, I know her. La. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Hungry Ghost Realm is one uh, of the different beings within this realm that is of the most severe suffering. Yeah. And using this, uh, the name of this particular set of beings within this realm as the realm name yeah, to depict, yeah, to highlight that this realm uh, in general, is of suffering. Mm. Yeah, so, not all ghosts suffer. Mm. But generally, not as good as the higher realms. Okay? Yeah. Uh, I recall my teacher in one of his, his talks, my late teacher, Sangmiao Xia Jing Lao Sang, in his talk, he mentioned about uh, there being this uh, uh, smaller spirit, or ghost, if you will. Yeah wanting to uh, learn the Dharma. So he encountered uh, Venerable, ah, also Venerable Maha Mughalana. And so Venerable Maha Mughalana brought him to see the Buddha. When, the, when Venerable Maha Mughalana reached, uh, uh, reached the Buddha, yeah, and then he turned around, eh, he couldn't find that small ghost. Yeah, so he was wondering, eh, what happened to him? Yeah, he's supposed to come and see the Buddha. Then he, he went out and he found him, found that ghost standing at the perimeter. Yeah? And he asked him, why didn't you follow along? <laughs> you know? And the small uh, spirit or ghost said, oh, I can't enter. He said, why? Why can't you enter? Oh, because in front of me are a lot of these mighty spirits. Yeah? They refuse to let me enter. Yeah, they have come to see the Buddha as well. They refuse to let me enter, so I can't enter. Yeah. Then what happened? Venerable Maha Mughalana tell them, he's with me, <laughs> something like that. Huh? Uh, so managed to bring him in, and then he can go and see the Buddha. Mm. Uh, so from this particular sutta, we see that there are also different grades of beings within the hungry ghost realm. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the Vinaya, have you all gone through the Vinaya before? No? You know what is the Vinaya? Yes, lah, huh? Yeah. So, in the Vinaya, it also talks about ghosts occasionally. 
yeah. For example, there were times where the monks cut the grass, yeah, cut the branches of the tree. And then as a result, hurt some of the spirits that is staying in the tree. Not all grass or trees have, but some of them have. Mm. So there was one particular occasion where one, uh, a, a monk cut a branch of the tree and then that spirit went to see the Buddha. Complained to the Buddha, in other words. He got hurt. <laughs> yeah. So then the Buddha uh, caught the monk over and then uh, after that, because of this occasion, set down a rule. Uh, monks should not be cutting the trees yeah, without giving prior notice. Yeah. So until today, whether in the Theravada or Mahana tradition, before we cut any of the trees, we have to make a notice. Yeah. Yeah. In, in all traditions, we have this rule. Yeah. In US, when we were cutting down some of the old trees, yeah, the old trees, some of them got infected by some, uh, I think, was it some moth? Yeah. So we have to cut it off because otherwise it's going to collapse and crush some of the dormitories. Yeah, so I was in charge of delivering all these notices. <laughs> yeah, because I was the karma official. Yeah, so I had to uh, print out the notice and then go to each tree to make the announcement. Yeah, yeah, very serious, you know. I had to give seven day notice. <laughs> no, no kidding. Yeah. Uh, in the Sangha, we heard of stories of how certain monasteries sometimes forget or neglect to do it and when they cut, then some of the members suddenly just, you know, have some problem. Yeah. Huh? Uh, typically, the, the resident monks have to do the notice, usually. Yeah, usually. Yeah. At least in the lineage I was ordained in, uh, uh, the Sangha had to do it. And before the Kama official go and post the notice, they must do a, uh, what do you call that? Uh, they must do a Sangha uh, meeting. Yeah, we call it Jie Mo. Uh, we must have an official meeting first. Uh, everybody must agree. Then appoint uh, the person to go and paste the notice. Uh, <laughs> ah, your home, then you all go and inform more. <laughs> so when I was supposed to go and inform, then I asked my senior monk. Because in our Sangha, because we are all Chinese, ma, Chinese tradition. So when we do the, like for example, uh, Uposata, we do the recitation in Chinese. Everything is in Chinese. So then I asked my senior monk, I say, Hey, Venerable, if I do in Chinese, uh, will the ghosts here understand? Uh? <laughs> because our monastery is in US, you see. <laughs> so I said, do I use English or Chinese? <laughs> and the, the best thing is, it was in the state of New Mexico. Yeah, so the locals, some of them don't even speak English. They speak Espanola. <laughs> so, so I look at him, he look at me, he said, Okay, la, bilingual, bilingual. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there are also, uh, talking about lay people's house, uh, apparently this also works not just for spirits, you know. It also apparently works for insects. Yeah, I've heard of cases where uh, when ho some houses are infected by insects yeah, or termites and so on, then the, the, the lay person is quite perplexed huh? because, you know, the first precept, Panatipata Viramane Sikapadam Samadhi Ami, yeah? I have to abstain from killing, right? Yeah? And it's not just one termite, huh? whole nest of termite. Yeah, if you bring in the, the company, oh, jialat. Uh, who is going to pay for it? Not the money, huh? the karma. <laughs> ah. So, uh, oftentimes they will come and consult Bante yeah, or uh, whichever temple they are with. 
Uh, so I've ever heard of case where the variable actually advised the lay person to make the notice, yeah, do a short prayer and then dedicate merits and then inform them. In a week's time, we're going to bring in the pest control. Please vacate as soon as you can. Yeah. Uh, now, caveat enter. <laughs> I must give the disclaimer, okay? Uh, I've heard positive cases. I've also heard negative cases. Uh, so, uh, in some cases, when they give due notice, on that day when the pest control arrived, the whole place is vacated. Yeah. As in the, the termites and all. But termites and all is quite easy because you can see it. Ma. But goes how to see? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, back to the story. Uh. The Buddha told the, the, that spirit to, uh, that he will find a tree for him. Mm, he will find a tree for him as a kind of like compensation. Uh, huh? yeah. So uh, the Buddha said, in the middle of the grove, there's this big tree. You can use that tree. And then he said, oh, but I cannot just use it. And then the Buddha said, if the Tathagata allows it, you can use it. Oh, then he was pleased and he went, went off. Mm. And so since then, there was the, there's this rule. Uh, you can ask Bhante also. Yeah? Uh, monks, nuns, uh, we, we, we are not to cut trees, even grass, yeah, without, uh, without due notice. Yeah. And we cannot cut it ourselves as well. Yeah. So there are such incidences. Quite different from our idea of ghosts. So what appears at night? Have you all read suttas about beings that appear at night? Huh? Hmm. Interestingly, when we watch movies, usually ghosts only appear at night. Now, now is it night? Yeah. Oh, be careful. Huh? Uh, they all do a hit count. <laughs> Later, there's extra people. Huh? You notice that the front row is empty. Uh, <laughs> wait, wait. Here, here, how many people do you all see in front over here? Three. Huh? I, I see three. You see four. <laughs> plus me, plus me. In the suttas, uh, what we see appear at night is seldom goes, you know. Oftentimes, what is described is devas. Hmm. Devas would come to visit the Buddha or try to visit ascetics, practitioners in the deep of the night. Hmm. Yeah. And it is described uh, in one of the sutta, it was asked, and the, the devas described that, you know, they don't come in a day because in a day, too hot. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Not that it's too hot. <laughs> too bright. No, 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 no. They were, they, the, the meaning of Dewa is light. They, they, are, they are very bright. Right? They are not afraid of that light. <laughs> it is that in the day, we humans are active. Mm. We humans are active. They do not delight in the company of human beings. Why? Because we have a lot of desire. Mm. Yeah. It is because they manage to subdue certain level of desire that they get reborn there. Yeah. If they delight in it, they will be reborn among us. <laughs> yeah. They they have abstained from yeah uh, uh, the kind of wanton lifestyle. Yeah. They observe the precepts, yeah, and those of the higher states, the form realms of uh, beings then they even practice concentration mm. and totally abstain from the five courts of sensual pleasure yeah so when they do come to the human realm to to seek the buddha for dharma uh, they don't come in the daytime mm. uh, this is very interesting when i read one sutta two sutta when i went through the pali canon i was like eh, this is interesting huh the heavenly beings don't come in the daytime world. They come at night. But yet, our popular culture, our usual notion of night and day is that, oh, night time, you know, ghosts come out. All the spooky things happen. Yeah? 
But if you look at the suttas, huh? sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Popular culture, usually more female goals than men goals. Uh. <laughs> why, why is that? Because female goals have long hair. Ma. <laughs> yeah, imagine if Sifu become ghost, not scary. Ma. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Suddenly you have a guy who goes with a long hair, a bit strange also. Yeah. Uh, I remember, you know, in the 90s, there's this uh, Kai Sing Kui. Uh, what is the name of that actor? Huh? Huang Bai Ming. I remember there was, there was an interview. Yeah, there was an interview. And the interviewer asked him, Wow, you make so many movies about ghosts. Are you afraid of ghosts or not? And then you know what he said? He said, no, I'm not afraid of ghosts. Ghosts are my friends. You know why? He said, because ghosts help me make a lot of money. <laughs> Instead, he said, I'm afraid of human. Human are the real ghosts. <laughs> yeah. Huh? Mm. So there are all these misconceptions about ghosts, you know. In the Pali Canon and also in the, in the sutras, in all the different traditions, there's no mention that ghosts have, uh, uh, have ERP. <laughs> ghosts have no ERP one, you know. They don't have restriction when they can come, when they can go. Yeah. In fact, I heard, do you know where, where are the places where there are a lot of ghosts? Number one place we usually think of is symmetry, right? Mm. What's the number two place? Toilet? Someone say toilet. <laughs> huh? Very dark place. Wet, huh? Wet and dark. Hotel. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people always see ghosts in hotel. Uh. Uh. Ah, okay. So knock three times and hang on, huh? Mm. <laughs> wow. Just now talk about sutta, everybody. Now talk about ghosts. <laughs> um, there is uh, there's this there's this saying that besides symmetry, a very popular place for ghosts is temples. <gasps> yeah. Yeah, and it's nothing scary, no. And there's a logical basis for it. And the reason is because the temples, monasteries, are usually peaceful places where nice people come together, where you all do recitation of verses of truth, and you all practice loving kindness and compassion. These beings are having a hard time, you know. I must remember earlier, what, what do we go through? That hungry ghosts are in the three lower realms, are in the state of woes. Yeah? Not happy place, no. Yeah, so they are in a state of suffering. So this is something very interesting that I observe. That in the Buddhist tradition, our attitude towards ghosts is not that of fear. Although there are suttas where spirits disturb the monks. Yeah, as you all know, that's the basis for metta sutta. Yeah? Because they disturb the monks, then the Buddha advised the monks how they should radiate metta, how they should practice yeah, to assure them that we come in peace. Yeah. So, all being said, how should we relate to ghosts? Yeah, we should consider them as fellow sentient beings. Uh, but that's not easy. Uh. <laughs> uh, that's really not so easy. Yeah? Even among human beings, we sometimes don't consider each other as fellow sentient beings, isn't it? Huh? Sometimes I have students, before or after Dharma talks, they will, they will chit-chat with me, or they, when they drive me to class or back, then they will tell me, Sifu, Whoa, nowadays, a lot of foreign talents. Huh? 
Correct? Wow, uh? oh, you see, suddenly there's silence. <laughs> you know what I tell them? I say, and? They say, no ma. They come here, they take our job, they take our house, they take our wife, they take our husband. <laughs> mm. no. That shouldn't be attitude of Buddhists. Huh? Yeah. When we recite, Sabbe Sata Sukita Hontu. Yeah, may all beings be well and happy. When we are in the train, yeah, we, we do our recitation, then we may all beings be well and happy. Then we turn around, accept all these foreign talents. <laughs> huh? Shouldn't be, isn't it? Yeah? We shouldn't be like that, isn't it? When we say, may all beings, sabbe sata, all beings, not, not just Singaporeans, no. Not sabbe Singaporean. <laughs> Isn't it? But all beings. Mm. Before we even talk about or treating ghosts as fellow sentient beings, we need to learn how to treat fellow human beings. Manusa. Huh? Sabbe manusa. Same, same. Yeah? We cannot think, oh, only Singaporeans deserve happiness. Huh? Yeah. How many of you are foreigners? Don't be shy. Raise your hand. Yeah. Welcome to Singapore. I hope Singapore has treated you well. Yeah? If not, come and see me after this. <laughs> As a monk, it is a very interesting journey. Yeah. Very interesting journey. I used to think of myself as a Singaporean, very proud to be a Singaporean. Yeah? Then, second, secondary, as a Chinese. Yeah. My mom always said, why? Because when I was in primary school, I really didn't like Chinese language. In secondary school, my maths teacher overheard me and my friend having this conversation. And she asked me, What did you say? Ni so sumo. And I said, Oh, Chinese class is a nightmare. <laughs> and then she go and tell the Chinese teacher, What's your lot? So Chinese was never something I associate with in the past, you know. Mm. But becoming a monk, I had to transcend that. Why? Because my teacher is not even Singaporean. He's from Northeast China. Yeah. So the only two English words I heard him say is yes and no. <laughs> All the texts that we go through are in Chinese. Traditional Chinese script, Zheng Kai. Zheng Kai. Ah, the proper term is Zheng Kai, not Fan Ti Zi. Ah. <laughs> fan Ti Zi is with reference to Jian Ti. Without Jian Ti, it's actually Zheng Kai. Yeah. To begin with, my Jian Ti already Pua Tang Sai, you know. <laughs> <laughs> then the worst thing is, the grammar is classical Chinese. Mm. So, become, yeah, Wen Yin Wen. Mm. So, becoming a monk, uh, was a very interesting, I mean, is, still is. Uh, <laughs> still is a very, very interesting process. There's so many things for me to learn, to transcend. And eventually, over the years, I start to identify myself with being a Singaporean lesser and lesser. Oh, it's on record. Uh. <laughs> Let me explain. I start to realize that if I identify myself too strongly, with being a Singaporean, then I may draw boundaries, artificial boundaries. I may hold on to these boundaries and be attached to these boundaries so strongly that I find myself not being able to reach out to non-Singaporean. But the Dharma, is it restricted to Singaporeans? No, isn't it? Yeah? All the Bantes in Singapore, they are not even Singaporeans. If they, if they have the mindset, Oh, the Buddha Dharma is only for Sri Lanka. Then we have no Mangala Vihara, isn't it? The same way I tell my fellow peers in the Chinese Mahana tradition. Buddhism is not about the Chinese language, you know. When we go to other countries, we need to translate and use the language in, the, in that country. Mm, we need to do that in order to reach out to others. Yeah. Mm. If we can do that over time, then maybe it becomes easier. Easier to have 
first of all, this mindset. Hey, of the six realms that the Buddha taught us, most of us cannot see ghosts and maybe don't want to see ghosts. Huh? <laughs> most of us cannot see, um, most of us can see animals. Can you all see animals? Say yes. Yes, uh, we can see animals. Most of us can only see these two realms, human and animal realm. Most of us cannot see ghosts, cannot see heavenly beings. Isn't it? Yeah. Asuras? Anyone? Yeah. The tricky thing about Asuras is there are so many different translations uh, and quite, quite a few different definitions of what Asuras are, you know. Yeah, because the term itself is also used in the Indian culture. Yeah. And in some other northern region of India, Ashura is the name of their god war. You know? So it's very interesting as we learn more. Then how about hell? Any of you want to go to hell? <laughs> uh, nobody wants to go to hell, huh? Yeah. Scary, huh? Mm. Then why did the Buddha tell us about all these realms? Yeah, the Buddha wanted to let us know that none of these realms are in, none of these realms are permanent. They are all impermanent. Sabbe Sankara Anichati. Sabbe Loka Anichati. Yeah, all the different worlds, no matter how high you go up in the heaven, no matter how low, deep in suffering you are, these two shall pass. Yeah, the famous words. Mm. But beyond that, yeah, we should consider there's no being that is permanently in any states. In other words, we are not really human also, no. Just due to conditions manifest as human, appear as human. This is the vipaka, this is the result. Yeah? Yeah. But by now, half of you <laughs> Um, but this is what the Buddha taught us, you know. Yeah, we should consider. It is because we identify so strongly as manusa, as human. Manusa is Pali. Yeah? My Pali is a bit rusty. Yeah? <laughs> but correct? Manusa, right? Yeah? Human. We identify so strongly as human. Not just human. We identify as Singaporean. Not just that. We identify as I'm man, I'm woman. Right? Ah, but the Buddha teach us this is just the result of karma. You know? When karma changes, then you appear differently. This is just a very short term. How short? In one of the sutta, the Buddha described saying that in a long distant past, there was this Brahmin teacher and he taught his students, telling his students, life is short. Do not waste your time. Go and practice. How short? It is as short as the life is like a bubble, you know, like a bubble when when what when you know the the, the 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 river passes through and then there's a bubble. Then as soon as the bubble appears, the, it's swept away and then it disappears. It's just like the spittle. A strong man may form a lump of foam and then, yeah spit out and as fast as it spit out it disappear it's just like the dew drop once the sun arises it vanishes yeah he and, and in this sutta the buddha described this brahmin teacher from long distant past using all these different metaphors and to describe how short and transient life is the ending the ending is the kicker yeah for those who remember Towards the end, then the Buddha said, at that time, human life was 60,000 years. <laughs> when I read the sutta, the front part, when I read it, I was like, mm, yes, sadhu, 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 yes, no, this, these are the metaphors and, you know, illustrations I've seen in so many places. But when I reached that line, I was like, wow. <laughs> 60,000 years and, and still that teacher say life is short. Yeah. And that's what the Buddha told them. That in the Buddha's time, 
Yeah? Human life is like about 100 years, according to the suttas. Uh, please don't go and check. Or according to the statistics and, and whatever records they have, then say, no, Sufu, that is wrong. Don't ask me. Uh, go and ask the translators. <laughs> But whether it's the Buddha's time or our time, our current time, what is our lifespan? Man is about 82.4, man, woman is about 84, 85. Yeah? Women, you all live longer. Wow. Huh? Good, huh? No, not good. The extra three years is behind, you know. <laughs> the extra three years comes behind, not in front, you know. It's not as though when you reach 25 years old or when you reach 18 years old, you live until 21 years old with the same health, same age for three years. The extra three years come behind that. <laughs> behind where you have to take pills, la. <laughs> you know, go for medical checkup every year, you know. Yeah. That's the nature of our life. Yeah. yeah the Buddha used all this to tell us Life is very short. You're just a human for a short while. Don't spend your time being attached to this body. Don't identify with this or that, even your gender, even this or that. Yeah. And going beyond that, then you can look upon others and say, oh yeah, I am suffering, you are also suffering. Oh. Then, as you do this reflection and practice over time, ah, one day, I hope, one day, you will meet a ghost. Huh? <laughs> no. I mean, one day, when you meet a ghost, you will be able to say, Ayah, my dear fellow sentient beings, you are suffering. Let me recite Metta Sutta for you. And not, Namo Tassa, Namo Tassa, Namo Tassa. And not like that. Yeah? but instead with compassion, just as Venerable Ananda has done. Yeah, when he saw that ghost, that hungry shade at the city gate, he was filled with compassion. He went to ask the Buddha, oh, this being is suffering. What can we do for this being? Yeah, and in, in the Pali Canon, there is a sutta where the Buddha said that beings in the lower realms, they have no farm. They cannot farm and get food. Yeah? They cannot provide for themselves. They depend on what? They depend on the living. Yeah? So this is where I must admit to you, uh, I read different translations of that same sutta, I still can't figure out which way is it, you know. <laughs> because there are two interpretations of that text. One is that the living do offering for the departed, meaning that the departed can partake in, like, you know, traditionally Chinese what we do. Uh, your father like uh, cha kui tiao, you buy cha kui tiao offer, then your father can eat yeah, because you offer. Another interpretation is that the food is offered to the Sangha and on that merit, then it helps the departed. Mm. Uh, it helps the departed. And this is where we come to another question mark. Yeah? What question mark? Transference of merits. Ah. Transference of merit. Anumo, anu, anumo dana. Yeah? When you all do uh, a puja and so on, then you all recite, isn't it? Yeah? Eta, vata, chaham, hehi, and so on and so forth. Yes? Can you remember? Uh, some of you not. Some of you... <laughs> Sometimes we must know, you know, we come for Dharma class. Yeah, don't neglect going for the puja also, you know. There's a lot of wisdom in the puja also. And then there are those who only come for puja, never go for Dharma talk. Yeah, but of course, all of you are here at Dharma talk, so no issue. Uh. Uh, why, why is this important? Because sometimes when we just go for Dharma talk, then we never go for other of the practices. Uh, a bit incomplete. Yeah. Incomplete in what sense? When you go for other practices, then you see, ah, hey, this is what I learned in the sutta, you know. Oh, this is what they are doing. Yeah. Otherwise, we will think that, ah, yeah, all this puja ceremony, all this is just 
ritual, you know. No, actually not ritual. Yeah. So, uh, ah, dedication of merits. So when we do, uh, let's say a puja, we do an offering, and then we do dedication of merits, right? Sometimes they call it transference of merits. When we say transference of merits, yeah, which is very common during the seven month, wow, you can imagine uh, if, the, if there's a central body in charge of merits, oh, high volume, you know. <laughs> Whole year, low volume. During the month of uh, the Hungry Ghost Festival, wow, volume, high volume transaction. Yeah? All around the world, Buddhists are transferring merits all over the place. Wow, they have to bring up backup servers to handle the load. <laughs> what do you all think? Can merits be transferred? Ah, cannot be transferred. Huh? That's the notion it can be shared. Yeah. Let's look at the transfer part first. Because although some of you say it's shared, not transferred, yeah, the rest keep quiet, you know. You know why? Because most people have this mindset, can transfer. Yeah. Cannot transfer, then we do all these merits, then my parents, what did they get? So let me dispel this first, okay? First of all, if merits can be transferred, the Buddha just sit down there, he don't have to give teaching for 45 years. He just, like, come, hurry up, very big group, come, I transfer merits for you. Tell me what is your name, I transfer to you. <laughs> huh? And each time the Buddha transfer, he has more merits. So infinite pool. Then he just keep transferring. Then, then he don't have to give teachings. What? Correct or not? Merits cannot be transferred. Wisdom cannot be transferred. Cannot. If it can, then the Buddha don't have to teach. <laughs> yeah? But this is a common misconception. There was once when I was at the Buddhist library during a, I think, it precepts retreat. So some students asked this question. And then and I mentioned this. Yeah, Bhante Dhammaratana was next to me. And then uh, the Professor Chandi, Chandima was, was at the far end. Yeah. When I mentioned this, well, everybody got tense, you know. <laughs> yeah, but this is the truth. But they didn't, didn't disagree. Uh. <laughs> hey, then what are we doing? Uh, the sharing of merits. Uh. When we say sharing of merits, strictly speaking, when we recite Eta, Vata, Chaham, Hehi and so on, we're inviting beings of the different realms who can rejoice in this wholesome deeds. To rejoice in it. Mm. And when they rejoice in it, they are developing wholesome merits also. So in a way, I would call it inducement of merit. Inducement of merit. Another way to look at it, so there's another angle, which is, <coughs> uh, for example, when our relative pass away, yeah, then they leave behind a lot of fortunes. Uh, yeah got house, la, got pekim. A oh, pekim is given by people. Huh? Uh, all these things. Then what do we do? We do charity, we do donation, we do dana, we do all kinds of meritorious deeds for them in their name, isn't it? Mm. So the question here is, what if they disagree? You donate, and when they know about it, they're like, what piang eh? Huh? What, what, what if that happens? Do they get married? Uh, let's consider. If they still get married, then it means that you can force marriage into people's mouth, you know. <laughs> yeah. That means you can just write anybody's name and they will somehow get that married. Right? Then we can just write anybody's name. Yeah. And then somehow the merit will ripen. And if you, let's say, oh, I dedicate this merit to this person, may this person learn Dharma. Then you write, all Singaporeans. Then suddenly, all Singaporeans, next day, wake up. Hey, how come I feel like learning Buddhism? Ah? <laughs> but I'm a free thinker. Leh. Why? Ah? <laughs> mm. 
And if that is possible, the Buddha would have done it a long time ago. Uh. All the masters would have done it. and <laughs> doesn't work that way. Uh. Yeah, so then some students ask me, Ha! Ah, then how? So I say, well, that's why it's important when your family members, your friends, and yourself especially, when you're alive, you should rejoice when people are doing good things, you know. And that's why the Buddha in the Anguttara Nikaya, the Numerical Discourses, Book 2, in one of the sutta called uh, Katanyu Sutta on Gratitude, he mentioned there are two parts. The first part is there are two kinds of people. One with integrity, the other one without integrity. And then the Buddha said, those with integrity are grateful. Those who have no integrity are not grateful. Then the second part, the Buddha said, so who are the people that we should be grateful towards? And the Buddha said, there are two persons that we have to be grateful towards, to whom their gratitude, their uh, kindness, it's hard to repay. Who are the two? Yes, very good. Ah, not bad. Huh? Recently, during the memorial, yeah, I said I, I, in, in my address, I mentioned that uh, through the students yeah, and devotees of Mangala Vihara, uh, we know about late Bhante. Ah, see, I asked, you can answer. Well, oh, very good. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Yeah. Give your pressure. I better go and read out. <laughs> In this sutta, the Buddha said, our parents had to, had to repay their kindness. Yeah. And in a way, it's linked to the seventh month. Why do people do all those prayers? Because they hope to repay their kindness. Out of devotion, they hope they can do even just a bit of things. Sometimes some younger students, they say, but Sifu, nowadays, they burn this, burn that, you know, pollute the environment. Shouldn't we tell them to stop? So I look at them and I say, to me, when your parents have passed away and you, you know that you cannot do anything else for them, Whatever you can think of, you are going to do. It is really what, like what they say, it's the thought that counts. There are two parts. The intent, yeah, which is devotion, love, piety, and then there's the method. Most people are not enlightened one. Most people never read the Pali Canon. Work. So they don't know what to do. Ma. <laughs> they, know, they don't know that while the parents are alive, they should do something for them first. So by the time the parents have passed away, then what can they do? Mm. And I ask young people, I say, you, you criticize the offering of food, offering this, offering that, burn this, burn that, you say it's not right. It's useless. No, no, it's true. Uh, quite useless. Uh. Do you all know that when you all burn the paper money, cannot be used, you know? <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, the bill, yeah, there's the kim zua, yeah, the, the, the beach color with the silver, it's actually gun zua, yeah, gun zua. Then there's another one which is the red color and gold color type. Then you fold, fold, fold into an ignorant. Yeah? Uh. Huh? Tea Kong Kim. Oh, Tea Kong Kim. Oh, wow. <laughs> that one, heavy class one, no. <laughs> then later on, there is the notes. Uh, later there's notes. Yeah, later on, come up with the, the bill. Yeah, and initially it was $1,000. Then as I grew up, it became $100,000. Then eventually become million. <laughs> Fortunately, yeah, fortunately, one day I was told we stopped doing that. My mom told us this account. One day, she was in the temple. Our, our family master is the, the late Venerable Wu Feng. Mm. And my mom said that 
One day, while she was in the temple with all the other devotees folding the paper money, you know, the standard type, you fold this way, you roll, and then you took, right? And the whole stack, you like that, like that, like that, then, <laughs> ah, I did it before. Mm. So my mom told me that one day while he was, she was doing the folding, right? You know what happened? Suddenly, the master came over and told her specifically, Le Hong, ah, my mom's name, Li Fang, Le Hong. Le Hong, ah, mena ni ma huan, ah, go zap ko zi zi xiu tiao hu liao. Meaning, you don't have to waste your time. Just take the $50, the real $50 one. <laughs> and at that point in time, I think it was maybe 80s. Uh. Huh? In the 80s, right? Oh, well, $50, a lot of money, you know. <laughs> yeah? And my mom just hearing that. Huh? And then she, she stopped burning after that. But the temper continued. To me, that incident tell me two things. One is the wisdom of the late master and the compassion that he has. Because it means that actually he knows all the while that you don't have to do that. But if he were to tell the devotees, my Amma and all those who come before her, cannot burn, cannot burn, what will they do? They go somewhere else to burn, no. <laughs> and as a result, they will not even learn Dharma. And as a result, you won't have me sitting here giving you Dharma talk. <laughs> Maybe I'll be at a Taoist temple giving Dharma talk. <laughs> mm. There's a time and place for everything. Fast forward decades later, now, when young people tell me, question the efficacy, the effectiveness of burning things and doing offering, I look at them and I ask them, on Facebook, when you send your friend a cake, can your friend eat it? Every year, August, my, my birthday is near to the seven month. No? It's actually smack in the middle of the seven month. Two days after the seven month. So a lot of students send me cake. Oh. <laughs> cake that I cannot eat. <laughs> Flowers that I cannot smell also. At least when, when families go to Qingming, when they offer the flowers, you can really smell the flowers. Oh. At least you can eat the food after the offering. Eh? All this cake and food and whatever so on Facebook, you cannot even see it. And if you don't have internet connection, you travel CTE halfway through, lost connection. Hey, wait, what, what did he send? I asked them. And I asked them then, but does it make you any less happy? No. Even though you cannot eat the cake, you still feel very happy, right? Why? Because it shows that your friend thought of you, yes. Again, it's the thought that counts. Mm. In Buddhism, the Buddha said, the mind is the forerunner of all. Huh? The thought, the, very important. We should not throw the baby out with the water, you know. Mm. When people actually even think about their parents, I mean in this day and age, if you see someone go to Go to uh, go downstairs and burn. Uh, maybe we should be kinder to them, you know. We should maybe educate people on the methods, the way to express this thought. But we shouldn't just throw it out altogether. Yeah? yeah, it's very hard for young people these days to even still want to go through that process, you know. Mm. Uh, but that is the way of the worldly people. Worldly people don't know what else to do. Burn law, offer law. Papa suka jia jie law. Yeah. I mean, my father is still around. I'm just saying. <laughs> but what did the Buddha say? The Buddha said that one's parents, the debt is so great that if a person were to carry both father and mother on the shoulders, for a hundred years and anoint them with oil, wash them, bathe them, massage them and give them the seven treasures in the whole world and even make them ruler of the 16 states. 
No, you cannot repay their debt. Wow. We ourselves cannot even be ruler. <laughs> but even if we make them rulers, you cannot repay them. Uh, but fortunately, the Buddha said, in the following ways, you can repay your parents' kindness. There are four qualities. Sing jie shi hui. Yeah, if you look into the Pali Canon, Katanyu Kata Sutta, yeah, Book 2, mm. on gratitude, you search for gratitude, access to insight.org. The Buddha said, the first is faith in the triple gem. The second is morality, observance of precepts. The third is generosity. And the fourth is wisdom. If the parents are weak in any of this, and if the child were to instill in the parents faith in the triple gem, instill in them morality where they are lacking, encourage them, yeah, uh, be able to help them to become generous, and where they are lacking in wisdom, to promote the development of wisdom. Uh, in these four ways, then, such a person truly repay the kindness of one's parents. Mm. But this is done when your parents are still around. No? <laughs> Don't wait until your parents are gone then. <laughs> a bit late. Ah. Ah. Since coming back in 2016, eh, no, sorry, 2006 or 16, 2006, uh, I've been telling young, young people, especially those who are undergrads, yeah, Occasionally, I will give talks in NUS or NTU or the, the universities and I'll share with them. Now you are undergrad. You are in Singapore, you are like, you know, you are cream of the crop. Huh? In due time, you will graduate, you go out to society to work, you become somebody. But the, when you become somebody, then you become busy. Spend time with your parents. I tell them. I say, never mind what your parents say. What they want to, to see is that you are okay. Spend time with them. Don't just give them credit card. And tell them, uh, what you need, just go and buy. Don't get them a maid to accompany them to go and buy. Not, not the maid's father, you know, your father. Like. <laughs> not the maid's mother, you know, your mother. Mm, I tell them. But as parents, we must also inculcate the right values also. Yeah. Don't solve everything with money. Some parents, I remember one encounter, one mother came to see me and tell me, Shifu, my son, uh, horrible, you know. Whew. Play with the handphone non-stop. Huh? Do your kids or grandkids play with, play with the handphone non-stop? Yes? Uh, nowadays, this is the problem, isn't it? First world problem. And nowadays, seven months, we also burn handphone. <laughs> huh? But I ask, sidetrack, uh, I ask my students, if you burn handphone, then you need to burn power bank, <laughs> adapter, wall plug. You need to burn power station. Otherwise, they run out of battery. They come and look for you. <laughs> and you need to burn telco, the whole infrastructure to give them internet access. <laughs> and you need to burn websites. <laughs> yeah, otherwise, they come and give you <laughs> Don't know nightmare or dreams. Uh. <laughs> Boy, uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Don't wait until your parents are, are gone, uh. then you burn their handphones. Teach them how to use the handphone. Spend time with them. But young people are very impatient. Oh. Uh, yeah, very easy, uh. just press on, press on. So easy, they won't ask you. Uh. <laughs> 
But to be fair, to be fair, when I was in my 20s, I tried to teach my father also. I tell him, it's very simple. Let me come, let me see. Let me show you. Then I show him. Then he, he started talking. I want to show him how to use the computer. He, he don't want to learn. He, he, he starts chit-chatting with me. <laughs> so over time, I realized, actually sometimes when parents ask us how to use this, how to use that, it's an excuse. La. I have to find something to talk to you. Ma. <laughs> our parents don't understand about our work. Right? So handphone, good excuse. Right? Hey, new handphone, I don't know how to use it. Can show me how to go on the internet or I actually just want to chit-chat with you, want to be close to you, want to be, ayo, ayo. You think about it. When we are young, when we are fearful, we run to our parents. Huh? Isn't it? All of us do. Even up to some point, when something happens, Ma, <laughs> even though my mom is not, may not be physically around me, you know. Yeah. How do we care for them. As parents, we must learn how to care for our kids so that they know how to care for others as well. One parent, the, the handphone story I mentioned, I, I sidetracked. Uh, she said her, her child played with the handphone non-stop. So you know what she said? She told the son, time is up, give me the handphone. So the son removed, refused. Have you encountered this before? Ah, so you, my, my student is very smart. You know what she say? She say, whose handphone is this? Then the son said, mine. Then the mother said, who buy it? Mommy. <laughs> mommy buy for me. Oh, the son very smart. Then the mommy said, whose money is it? Mommy's money. So, Mommy spend mommy's money to buy for you. So because it mommy used mommy's money, so it's mommy's. So you have must return to me. Eh? The son oh yeah, oh, makes sense or oh, oh, oh. return no. Oh. Oh, so my student was very happy, you know. Before you all go off with this idea, please uh, this is the wrong idea, okay? <laughs> this is the wrong approach, uh. I, I I told her, I said do you know what you just did? Then she said, why? What's wrong? I was trying to tell him that, you know, the, the value of money, that you need, you need to, you know, work for it. Yeah. So I told her, the trouble is, your intention is good, but the method, unwittingly, you are teaching your child that money talks. <laughs> you know, Hong, uh, Cantonese say, yao chin tai sai. If you have the money, then you can decide. I told her, no, that is wrong. Money only enables you to buy. Money doesn't decide whether you should buy or not. Do you, do you understand? Yeah. Money is just the, the means to buying something. It shouldn't be the reason for buying something. It can be the reason why you cannot buy, you are unable to buy, not why you shouldn't buy. I always remember and I always share this story about the toy that I didn't get to buy. Did you all, have you all heard of the story of the toy that I didn't get to buy? Some of you heard before, huh? Long, long time ago. <laughs> when Sifu was still a kid, maybe P4 or P5. When I was a kid, I always go to the market with my mom. Kids last time can do that. Gumting very good. Why? Because morning session, afternoon session, ma. Ah, so when you are morning session, then you go to school. Afternoon session, morning is free. So you go to market with mother, ma. Ah, so one day I went to the market and then I saw this toy. You know the traditional market? Yeah? One side is the market, one side is the hawker center. Yeah? And then it's like a, like a one or two square and there's usually two stories. And on top, they will sell all kinds of things. And of all things to sell, they sell clothes. <laughs> yeah? Remember? 
Yeah. Now come to, come and think about it, wouldn't the clothes have all the bark, you know? All the <laughs> all the smell, huh? I don't know. But besides clothing, they also sell appliances, they also sell toys. And one day I saw this toy. Wow, I was so mesmerized by the toy, you know. It was this spaceship plane thing. Uh. Yeah. But you buy, then you must disassemble, then you assemble it, you know, those type. I can't remember how much it is it. Maybe like three dollar sixty cents or something. Hmm. Huh? Two dollar. Huh? Nali o liang mao. Wow, ni kai tian na liang mao. No, 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 no. I remember that was a few dollars. It was a few dollars. No, kaka is liang mao. Do you remember kaka? Uh, you open, then there's all the cheese ball or whatever. Then that sometimes, usually they have a toy inside. Then they have a man, the circle hand, then they can join together to form a lot of things. Uh. <laughs> I happen to have good memory, right, relatively good memory. Anyway, what happened? I wanted to buy. Mommy said, Do, cannot buy. So, I insisted. She also insisted. So she dragged me all the way down to the second floor. <laughs> drag, 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 drag. Then she came on telling me, Mama, no money to buy. In the late 70s, early 80s, I think most families don't have extra cash to buy twice one, you know. So as a result, those kids born in the 70s, 60s and 70s are very creative. We have to make toys, law. <laughs> Kids nowadays, zero creativity required. Everything ready-made, play. <laughs> Kids last time, you have to figure out plaster scene, pen cat, zoom, aeroplane. That day was not about plaster scene. That day, my mom dragged me all the way and then towards the boundary of the market. And when I insisted, she looked at me and she said, like our tongue, my. Are you going to go back with me? I said, no, mine. Why? What? No. I mean, seriously, what is a child supposed to do? It's me, my toy, and my principal. <laughs> I mean, you have to stand up for something, right? At that age, you have to stand up for yourself, for the toy. <laughs> so I insisted. No, I'm going to stay where I am. So he let, she let go of my hand and said, Let me go, let me go, let me go. Oh, steady. And she really just walked off, you know. And I, I stood there and I saw her walk. Tuk, 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 tuk. From this big, walk, 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 until this big, until this big, until I cannot see her. Wow, that's where I panicked, no. Jialat. <laughs> But I continue standing there, <laughs> keeping a lookout. <laughs> and then along the way, I think I must have stood there for about two or three hours. <laughs> yeah. And there were a lot of people who come to the market, ma, morning. So some of the uncle passed by, auntie passed by. Some of them are quite nice. One, one lady passed by and then, boy, are you okay? You know what I told her? Mind your own business. <laughs> 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 Sometimes I amaze myself. Uh, at that age, I know how to say my own business. <laughs> but she's really nice, no? After, when she's done, when she was coming out, she came and, you know, attend to me again, no? She, then she came over. Boy, why don't you sit on the bench? Then I just glared at, him, uh, at her. Wow. I mean, think about it. If I go and sit on the bench and my mom come back, well, no face, you know. You must stand there. <laughs> if ever you have a standoff, you must stand. It's called a standoff. You cannot sit down. But by the time it was 11 plus 12, I was too tired. You know, and I was hungry. So I walked back. The walk of shame. Quai quai teng chu. Quai quai teng chu. Yeah, bo pian no. Yeah. So that's why we should, we should have a 
we should have an agreement on all parents. If all do together, no problem. The problem is some do, some don't do. <laughs> then they have comparison. <laughs> uh, but those days are gone. Uh. I pity the kids. They don't have merits. They don't have merits to be disciplined. To have people discipline us, you need to have merits, you know. Nothing better to do, uh, d- discipline you. So anyway, went back home, then realized I don't have the key because I was too young to have keys. I had to press the doorbell. My mom opened the door. My mom opened the door, look at me, don't say a single word. Went back to the kitchen to cook. Uh, this is our style. Don't say anything. <laughs> went in, closed the door, closed the gate. Then my uncle heard about it. Uh, this is one important lesson. Parents nowadays like to reason and explain to kids every single thing. I keep telling parents, I, the, all the young parents, Mang si ni ya. We always think, hey, but Sifu, good to reason, right? Isn't it? Should we be reasonable? Yes. But I tell them, Jiang Tao Li, Jiang Tao Li. Tao Li is Lianga Tong Tao Li the Ren Jiang the. You understand? Yeah, you want to reason? The other person must be reasonable, must know reason. My uncle that day didn't reason with me. He came to my room, grabbed me, uh, no, tell me, this time you are wrong. That's it. It was a statement. He was passing a sentence. <laughs> it was not a hearing. <laughs> not a discussion whatsoever. He's not interested in my opinion. <laughs> I was going to... Uh, Before I can say anything, he just grabbed my hand and dragged me to the kitchen. Of course, today, people will charge you for manhandling, uh, <laughs> for child abuse. Uh. But I've been telling parents, sometimes you have to do that. You know? And I'm glad my mother did that and my uncle did that. Drag me to the kitchen, say sorry. Oh, I don't know why I cried. <laughs> Probably not because I was sorry. <laughs> Probably because I didn't get my toy. <laughs> but I remember I was a bit teary when I was saying sorry. But all these years, I was look back at that one day when my mom refused to buy that toy. As the one day he, she teach me that I cannot get what I want by kicking up a tantrum. When we think about seven month festival, it's, it's not just about ghosts. It's not about ghosts, really. Who are these ghosts? These ghosts are our ancestors. If they are in the hungry ghost, ghost realm. For, for all I care, most of them are reborn as human beings in Deva realms, in other realms. But in one last sutta I want to share with you, Mata Sutta. In the Sangyutta Nikaya, we went and searched Mata Sutta, called Mother. The Buddha said, We have been going through samsara since beginningless time. Beings, you know, as this, as that. You cannot find one being who has never been your mother, who has never been your father, your brother, your sister, your friend, and so on. If you reflect deeply on this, what's the implication? Implication is, whatever goals there are out there were once our parents, isn't it? Were once our parents, for whom we cried for, year, for days, for months, and maybe even for years, that every, every time we think of them, we grieve, and we wish we can meet them again. So what's so scary about seeing a ghost? If you truly appreciate this teaching. 
in which case then the seven month festival is truly not about a scary month but a time of reflection a time of gratitude to think about those in the past who have benefited us and to consider how can we benefit them and in turn perhaps to consider how should we benefit the future generation Thank you. Sad, sad, sad. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. First question. Knock three times. <coughs> <laughs> So there is, there is this, this notion uh, that before you enter hotel room to knock three times. Uh, mm. uh, yeah, so so in, the, in the Sangha, we actually have this practice that when we go to a new place to stay, uh, depending on the different lineage, uh, in the lineage I was trained in, when we enter, we snap our finger to announce our arrival. Mm. And then we may recite a verse, yeah? uh, like in the Theravadan tradition, you recite Metta Sutta. But when we say recite Metta Sutta, it's not simply just reciting, no, no. So if you go in and you take out your handphone and play Metta Sutta, <laughs> yeah. because it's about radiating Metta. It's about when you enter to consider. May all beings within this vicinity, may all of you be well and happy. I come as a disciple of the Buddha. I come holding the banner of truth, banner of love and compassion. If you are suffering, come and embrace the good Dharma. Come and learn the good teaching. And may you be liberated in due time. <laughs> so, no, so. <laughs> ah, that's why the masters come out with mantra and parita shorter <laughs> yeah, so in the Chinese tradition when you enter you just recite Amitofo mm. but similarly in the Chinese tradition we have this saying that means you just make the sound but you don't have the heart. Uh, because when we say Amitofo, never mind the, the source and basis. Uh, the meaning of Amitabha is that is uh, infinite light, infinite uh, lifespan. Yeah. So uh, when we recite that, it is to wish wellness to whoever that you encounter as well. Yeah. So it's a very short verse. Yeah. Or you, like in uh, Tibetan tradition, they will recite Tashi Dele. Yeah. Uh, so whichever tradition you are familiar with, yeah. when I say familiar, it means you resonate with. You really feel when you recite. Consider. Uh, give me a minute. Uh, like when you, you know, when you recite, when we recite Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa. Now when we recite this, oftentimes we recite as a, you know, as a process. Namo Tassa, it's also quite nice. Wow. Yeah. But when you consider the meaning, homage to the blessed, perfectly enlightened one, you know, wow, the whole thing is, you consider, you're not paying homage, you're not paying respect to just somebody ordinary, you know. That in our, we have the opportunity within our time period to have encountered someone who make the claim to be free of suffering and nobody was able to refute him. And because of that, subsequently, others followed his lead, took his example and practiced practice rightly and 
discovered the same truth that he discovered. Uh, when you recite in this way, oh, the feeling is different. Isn't it? When you recite, Karaniyam Atakusalena, when you recite, and you don't just recite as a, as a verse, not just as a, as a uh, chanting, but embodying the meaning. Yeah? The first opening is Metta, yeah? Karuna. Wow. So, so, but to do that, uh, you cannot just chant on the first time. Uh. Yeah. You have to familiarize yourself with this, this attitude. When I, well, I choose to use the word attitude because if we say thought or mind, sometimes people feel that it's a bit too dry. Mm. But it's how you relate to others. Metta, karuna is how you relate to others, isn't it? The, the wish, when you see someone without happiness, to give them happiness. The wish, when you see someone suffering, to remove their suffering. Mm. When we go to a new hotel room, and we knock three times, there are different ways of knocking also. <laughs> it's just like when someone comes to your house and you... <coughs> versus... But that's just the sound. Of course, be gentle. Huh? But also, what, what do you bring by knocking? If someone knocks on your door or doorbell and you open and it's a salesman, Hello, miss. Hello, auntie. Uh, today you are very lucky. Uh, I want to sell you this cup, this mug. Usually $100. Today sell you $50. <laughs> uh, how do we feel towards such a person? Not so pleasant, isn't it? Because that person wants something from us. What if someone knock on the door and come in and when you open up and the person starts scolding you? Scold you, scold you. Yeah? Or spray on your, actually sp spray the wrong door. It's supposed to be neighbor <laughs> spray your door, yeah, yeah. So, what the person bring to the house to the door will determine how you are received. So when we say knock three times or you chant parita, it's not just that. You know, what kind of heart do you bring to the place? Initially, we when we knock three times and so on, we are hoping a. Eh, Lao Xiong, Lao Xiong. I knock already, huh? you all leave me alone. Huh? Please, huh? don't know where you are. Huh? Uh, please, uh, please. Huh? Jiu Gui, huh? <laughs> uh. So this is one way. This is the most rudimentary way. That means, I don't disturb you, you don't disturb me. Please leave me alone. Another way is what I mentioned earlier when you go there, to offer the Dharma. Oh. Offer loving kindness for them. To consider, imagine if it's your relative, long, 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 long lost relative that you don't even know. But now trap there. Trap there. Imagine if you are trapped there. Now, now let's just imagine if we are trapped in a place and finally someone comes. Of course, you're going to go there. Hey, hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Correct or not? Maybe that's why when people go and stay hotel, they keep coming. Uh, because they are trapped. Uh. Yeah. And if you go there with such a mindset, maybe you will not be so fearful, you know. Let me tell you one ghost story, okay? <laughs> there was one time I stayed in a monastery. I don't tell you which monastery. Uh. <laughs> Early morning, Around, uh, around 6 plus, not so early also, but I have to follow the regime of the monastery. Ma. So around that time is where they do the morning practice. So when I arrived, I was quite early, so I walked along the side of the corridor towards the front doors. So as I walked towards the, the front, I saw this monk climb up the, the stairs further up and then he sat down near one of the pillars. I didn't notice who that is because it's a bit of a distance. And because 
in the monastery, oftentimes you have visiting monks, you have monks going off, you, and there are quite a lot of monks, so you can't really tell who is who. But I noticed that when I was approaching, he retracted his leg to let me pass. So I walked past, then I walked around, and I noticed that, eh, oh, I was too early. Nobody has opened the, the door yet. So I wanted to go back, turn around, to ask him whether there is still morning practice or should I go back to my room to do my own practice. I turn around, he's gone war. <laughs> and then I thought, huh? he just arrived and then he go off. Then I look around, I don't, it, it's an open space, you see. Yeah, the staircase down is, a, is quite a distance before there's a turn. He couldn't have just, so I look around, look around, eh, bohu. And then as I recollect, it looked a bit grayish. Oh. <laughs> like, like, even if I wear the grey robes, right, you have the skin colour, the black hair, and then, you know, but it looks like one, one grey colour like that, something like that. Then, I thought, hmm, is it really a ghost? Ghost monk some more leh. <laughs> Then when, then I thought, ah, maybe he need someone to talk to. Maybe he need counselling. Then, eh? still not there. Eh, still not there. <laughs> yeah, serious. For a moment, I thought maybe ghost. Then the next moment, I thought, hey, maybe he needs he need someone to talk to. Uh. maybe he need counselling or you know, or something like I don't know. So I I really. I was hoping to see him like, like that, then I see him, you know. Yeah, but I didn't see him. I didn't find out whether it's a ghost or not. Until maybe one or, one or two years later, I talked to one senior monk. And then, I can't remember the occasion, but I happened to mention it. And then this senior monk, when I mentioned the details, uh, then his face just went like deadpan serious, you know. And then he asked me, have you discussed this with anybody else? Then I said, no. At that point in time, I haven't mentioned in any talks. Because I don't, know, I don't even know what it is. Ma. Then he said, oh, then I think you really saw a ghost. <laughs> because he said, another monk mentioned an encounter as well. And that monk also never tell anybody else <laughs> except him because he's a senior there. So I, oh, that's interesting. Hmm. Sometimes in temples, when suddenly there's some sound or what, there was one time I was at another centre. Middle of the night, wow, the door outside, not my room door, the door outside, keep on rattling. Oh, do, 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 do. Like, you know those Western movies, the ghost movie, the door, do, 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 like that. So I was like, wow, well, hey, I need to sleep there. <laughs> so I woke up, then I checked my door, because before I checked, I didn't know which door is it. So I checked my door, no. Then I went out. Then I saw the door, do, 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 do. Then I turned on the lights, I opened up. Bo Lang Li. Then I closed. Then the door was silent. Then Occasionally, do, 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 do. Then I thought, mm. you know what I did? Mm. So I locked the door. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then uh, I declared, okay, if it's a spirit or ghost or whatever, come out. Don't waste my time. I need to sleep. <laughs> and really, really. Yeah. I mean, I'm okay to counsel, but you cannot make noise and I cannot sleep, ma. <laughs> Yeah, if you want to, if you need counselling, just sit down. We can get over in one hour or something. You whole night ding dong, ding dong, ding dong. Uh, if you cannot even open the door, then sorry, man, not powerful enough. Don't waste my time. <laughs> uh, not not joke, uh, real, real encounter. Yeah, so our attitude towards ghosts. Don't be afraid of ghosts. They're suffering. Have compassion for them. Huh? Mm. Question.
Yeah, the question is still on goals. Huh? Uh, so we, we we come here to learn about goals and uh, how we should treat goals. So like in any dharma, we have got the learning process, the mm. practice, and then realization. So what we have gone through is just the learning. We haven't put it into practice yet. And worst thing, realization is very far away. So my question to you is, <coughs> if we actually encounter a goal or many goals actually, uh, many goals are uh, either one or many. Uh, if oh. we actually encounter one or many goals, uh, uh. what would be the best way to run? See? Because uh, this is what we have been <laughs> conditioned to do to run, and and we cannot we cannot practice your your thing because we only learn today. Uh. So we have to learn to run first as a first step, then come back to <laughs> practice some more, not to run, not to run so far. So I, my question to you is. What is the best way to run away? Best because, way to run. Because we have got a whole, whole, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, the whole baggage. Baggage of views, momentum carrying on. We can't just stop, you know, because yeah. we haven't got there yet. Yeah, right. So, so my, my question to you, yes. how, what is the best way to run or walk, or slowly walk away? Or what? That's my question yes. to you. We, we cannot do it your way yet, because <laughs> we, are not, we are not there yet. <laughs> Actually, uh, he's right, you know. If you're not ready, uh, better run. Uh. <laughs> but don't run into the road. Uh. Yeah, the ghost will not kill you, the car will kill you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then later the ghost tell you, I was trying to warn you of the car. <laughs> that would be ironic. Uh. Uh, but it is true. We can only do what we are able to do at this point in time. If you still feel afraid, then what can you do? You cannot be, we, I cannot be asking, Sifu cannot be asking you all to oh, think, oh, go and look for ghosts to counsel. Ma. Personally, I also don't go around looking for ghosts to counsel. Ma. <laughs> only when I accidentally encounter something a bit strange, then I have this thought. Mm. Again, the thought that counts. Uh. Uh, but before that, uh, let me share with you another sutta. Not to mention ghosts. Ghosts is lower realms. Ma. There was, there's another sutta where uh, it's about the Asura. So there was this heavenly being who was captured by one of the Asura. Yeah, because in the sutta, it, it, it talks about the devas and the asuras constantly in, in conflict. So one day, one of the asura caught one of the deva. And then at that moment, the deva recited, Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Oh, then swiftly, the asura let him go and he was free. And the Deva went to see the Buddha and told him about it. And then the Asura went back and the Asura king asked him, Eh, how come you come back empty-handed? I thought you caught someone. And then the, the Asura told, told the Asura king, Oh, he recited the verse. He's a disciple of the Buddha. At that moment, I think it was one of the Indra Deva or something, appeared above me and warned me, he is a disciple of the Buddha. If you dare do anything to him, I will split your head into seven parts. <laughs> There's such an account in the Sutta. Not just one, a few. You can try. No? <laughs> the question is, how much faith we have? You see, when that Deva was in danger, that was the first thing that came to mind, no? That he recited. Yeah? He paid homage to the Buddha. But for us, when we are in danger, when we are in conflict with others, what do we do? We call lawyer. <laughs> huh? uh, we call police. We call ma. <laughs> uh, that's the difference. Uh, so that day one is quite special. The disciples of the Buddha in the Buddha's time is quite special. When they are in danger, they look to the Buddha for refuge. When we recite, Buddhang saranang gachami, not for fun, no. 
we are taking refuge in the person within our time period to have become awakened now. We are taking the Buddha as our teacher, as our refuge. Wow! If we know more about the Buddha, then our faith in the Buddha becomes so strong. The Buddha in one of the suttas said, if disciples are in the forest, uh, in whatever they are practicing, and they are in danger, they can do this six recollection. Yeah? You all know about the six recollection? Buddha no sati, Dhamma no sati, Sangha no sati, and then Sila no sati, Dana no sati, and Dewa no sati. Yeah. Nian fo, nian fa, nian sen, nian jie, nian si, nian tian. Six recollection. Yeah. When I read it, the Buddha said, Who, whoever is in danger, not just hear a sound, then scared or in real danger, were to do this reflection, even if he perish, he will be reborn in a good realm. Initially, when I, when I first learned about this sutta, I thought, oh, must be some magical power. Wow. You know? But over, over the years, I realized that it's not so much that, you know. The real magic is how much you connect with who the Buddha is. How much faith confidence you have, how much sada you have in the Buddha, in him being awakened. How much faith do you have in the Dharma? But to have faith in the Buddha, Dharma or the Sangha, you need to know about them first. And that's why every week you all come here and recite Iti Piso Bhagava Araham Sama Sambundo and so on. Yeah, isn't it? Uh, when you recite when you recite in Pali alone, it gives you a very strong devotional impact. Uh, but before you start the puja, good to come earlier and read through the tr English translation. Mangla Vihara yeah, is is quite unique compared to many other centers in other countries. Yeah? In Singapore, we are very fortunate. Most of the Theravadan centers, when you have the Pali chanting, you have the English translation. And some centers, even the Chinese translation. Ah, come earlier, familiarize yourself with it. Mm. Why? Because as you read through all those verses, it is describing to us who the Buddha is, how the Buddha is. In the Buddha's time, not everybody know about the Buddha, no, because last time no internet, no YouTube. <laughs> yeah? So what happened? When the Buddha go to a new town, then what, there'll be some people who know about him. Then they'll say, ah, there's an ascetic, ascetic Gotama, who has arrived in this place. This report has been said about him. And it, what follows is what we are reciting now. Itipiso, Bhagava, Araham, Samma, Sambuddho, Vijja, Charana, Sampano, Sugato, Lo, Kavido, and so on and so forth. In the past, when they say it, they are not chanting, you know, they are telling each other, this is what I heard, you know. He is an awakened one, he is a knower of the world. He's a teacher of gods and men, and so on and so forth. It would be good if you go and listen to what he has to say. Mm. So just like them, today, we, we don't always know him. So when we recite that, we need to know what we're reciting. Otherwise, it's just a devotional development, which is also good. But even better, if you learn about the qualities. And that's why that the Buddha Vandana is also known as the, the nine qualities of the Buddha, the epithets. Yeah? Yes? Ah. Oh. Ah, so before, just now that brother asked, but we're not there yet. How? Ah, have to start somewhere. Lah. 
uh, come to Mangala Vihara if you are not coming yet uh, come for chanting and then develop that devotion so that even you're in danger you see real goals or human goals <laughs> you, you don't go go and look for the wrong thing uh. Uh, in your mind immediately you you think itipiso bhagavato arhato samma sambuddhas ah and then you'll be f safe you'll be okay oh. next question any more questions no questions mm. then i ask one question ah uh, okay just now sufu you mentioned that uh Sometimes in the night time, mm. those that are unseen beings that appear might not be ghosts, they are deva. Yes. How do we differentiate? Ah, how do we differentiate? Ask them. <laughs> <laughs> if we go by the sutta, uh, the devas appear as light. So if you look at some of the uh, biography, you look at some of the talks given by some of the masters, like in the Sri Lankan tradition or the Thai tradition or even the Chinese tradition, they describe how when they stay in the forest, in the middle of the night, sometimes villagers describe how that the hut they are staying in is lighted up very brilliantly. And sometimes they see the whole forest filled with light and they cannot find the light source. Such description. Yeah. So if you, whoa, 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 whoa. then suddenly there's a bright light. Um, you must be careful. Probably car. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Any other questions? Okay, let's have the last questions. Yes. Uh, Sifu, so what about the wake chanting? Ah, wake ah, chanting, yes. Whether these deceased get the merits, if let's say there's uh, like, like, they like get the monks to do the chanting or maybe their family members to do the chanting? Mm. Uh, as mentioned earlier, not so much that they get the merit, but they get to rejoice in the wholesome deeds. Some people question and they wonder, will it really impact their future rebirth? Yes and no. If a person has heavy karma, heavy wholesome karma, heavy unwholesome karma, yeah, kusala, akusala, yeah, heavy ones, then by the time you do chanting, they are gone already. A bit late. Yeah, because once they are once their lifespan come to an end, they will have taken spontaneous rebirth in the heavenly realms for the kusala, and for those in the lower realms, especially in the hell realm, they would have been reborn spontaneously. No chance for you to help them. Uh, no chance. Um, most of the time, most of us, most of us, um, have not done sufficiently good so so intensely or so intensely wrong yeah so still the question begs to be answered or begs to be asked but how does it influence them so um, again uh, I share with some students before imagine imagine if you are now in exams right and during exams, by right, you are taking the exam here and there's aircon, there's fan and it's fairly quiet. Then you can focus, isn't it? But now, if the aircon, aircon is spoiled, then it's warm. And then they have to open the window. Then there's haze. Do you think it will affect your results? Yes. Yeah, so unfortunately, most human beings can be affected by our environment. Mm. So it is the wish that by doing those uh, recitation, it can remind 
the, the departed, if the departed is still around, to be uh, reminded of the teachings. Mm. So in the Theravadan tradition, we have the Manara Sati, yeah, to recite those verses of dependent origination, of impermanence, yeah, so that they can, what? They, they are, that clinging and attachment is not so strong. Uh, to help them in this way. Uh, besides that, uh, when I uh, attend wakes and memorial services, especially wakes and funerals, I would also encourage the family members to think of the goodness that the person has done before. Yeah, to remind them of the goodness they, had, they have done, done before. In this way, uh, it is possible that uh, they may rejoice in the good that they have done in the past and connect with that wholesome deed. Uh, one just now said last, uh, now really last. Uh. <laughs> There's one sutta. Uh, there was this person who came to see the Buddha. After consulting the Buddha, he was going to leave. But it was lunch time. So when he was going to leave, he hesitated and he asked the Buddha that at that point, if he were to leave, the, the whole place is very busy. What if when he leaves, he get knocked down by uh, an elephant, knocked down by an ox cart, a horse cart? He would die in a horrible way. Would he, on account of that, be reborn in the lower realms? The Buddha told him, he said, consider this, if a tree has been leaning, growing towards the east, and now, intermittently, suddenly, someone were to take an axe and chop it off, would this tree fall towards the east or fall towards the west? And he replied, of course, towards the east. And the Buddha said, similarly, your whole life you have been conducting yourself in wholesomeness. Yeah? So, if you were to perish even in this way, you would incline towards wholesomeness, towards a happy destination. Hmm. Yeah. I want to take this opportunity to thank Mangala Vihara for continuing this, this uh, practice of having Dhamma talks yeah, to learn and practice together. I hope today's talk has helped you to have a better understanding of the seven-month festival and also an appreciation of the, the Buddha's teaching on the six realms, on how we can relate to ghosts. Not with fear, not with repulsion, but with love and compassion. I wish all of you good health, happiness, and may we all also extend dedication to those in Hong Kong. May they find peace in their life, in their heart, both the protesters and the police and the administration. All Hong Kongers, may they be well and happy. May we also extend dedication towards those who perish and are suffering in the various forest fire from the nearby Indonesia to the distant Africa and Amazon and all the different forest fires in the world. May all beings be well and happy. Sabbe Sata Sukita Hontu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, Sufu, for the wonderful talk. So now you're